tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs. And become a patron today to show your support and get instant access to our extensive archive of downloadable ad-free tales of terror. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Disclaimer. Horror Hill is a horror anthology podcast bringing you scary stories from all corners of the internet and beyond. As such, certain stories include content that some listeners might find offensive. Listener discretion is advised. Well, hello there, listeners, and welcome back to Horror Hill. I'm your host, Eric Peabody. And I'm here to help you ring in the new year in the best way possible, with stories of the violent, the vicious, and the vile. I have two tales for you this evening, both of which involve that oh-so-comforting cliché, the nuclear family. We'll be opening up with Small World by K.G. Lewis. Now, it's been a while since I've been to any of the larger, more corporate amusement parks in the good old USA, but I guarantee that I haven't forgotten the specific hell of one particular song-based ride. In fact, I'm fairly certain that just by mentioning the title, many of you are already cursing my name for getting it stuck in your heads. Well, friends... K.G. Lewis is here to help validate all of the creepiness you felt while stuck in that dark, water-filled cacophony. Please keep your arms and legs inside the boat for the duration of the ride. After that, we'll be closing up with, I found a decapitated head in my father's basement. It escaped. By J.H. Salem. This one has it all, folks. Serial killers, old family secrets, cults, and alien Lovecraftian landscapes. It's like a delicious buffet of violence and terror. What a perfect standard to set for the new year, eh? You're listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to help support Horror Hill and also remove these pesky ads, head to ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. You'll get instant access to hundreds of ad-free stories, and we can scale back some of our uh, less savory means of generating money for the show. By the way, you wouldn't happen to still have all of your organs, would you? And now, from author K.G. Lewis, I give you Small World. My wife, son, and I ran up to the entrance of the ride right as the young attendant latched the rope to the metal pole, blocking our path. Sorry, folks, he said. The ride's closed for the night. Don't you have time for one more group? I pleaded, looking over at the young couple he had let through a moment before we arrived. 
This is our last night here and we didn't get a chance to ride earlier. I put my hands on my son's shoulders, hoping he would take pity on us and let us through. The attendant looked at each of us and then sighed. Go ahead. He nodded towards the entrance as he unlatched the rope. Thank you so much, I said, ushering my wife and son before me. We hurried down the ramp until we caught up to the couple that had entered the ride before us. The young man and woman didn't seem to be in much of a hurry. They took their time walking through the winding queue, stopping every once in a while to make fun of one of the silly graphics that adorned the wall. I cleared my throat, hoping the teenagers would take the hint to either hurry up or let us pass, but they did neither. What they did do was turn back and look at me, then start whispering and giggling to themselves. Thanks to them, our progress to the landing platform was painfully slow. By the time we were assigned a row to sit in, it was just me, my wife, and son, and the couple, riding together in the last boat of the night. Everyone else that was already in line when we started making our way to the landing platform had already boarded the ride several boats ago. That's weird, I thought. For some reason, the attendant had placed the couple in the front row and us in the last one, leaving the four rows in the middle empty. I thought they were always supposed to fill the rows one after the other in order whenever possible. At least, that was how they did it for every other ride we had gotten on in the park while we were there. The attendant was probably just trying to be nice. That seemed like the most reasonable explanation for the seating arrangement. Since it was the last boat of the night, maybe the attendant was trying to ensure that we would get to enjoy the ride by placing us as far away from the obnoxious teenagers as possible. Are you ready? I nudged my son, who was already grinning in anticipation of what was to come. He nodded his head several times in rapid succession, which was a sure sign of his excitement. As the boat lurched forward, I leaned over and whispered in his ear, Here we go. He giggled in response, eager to start his first journey through The World is Small. A dated boat ride through the nations of the world is depicted by animatronic children singing a catchy tune in various languages. When the boat entered the tunnel that led into the ride, I glanced down at my son. He looked up at me, that big grin still plastered across his face. You're gonna love this ride, I said to him, and then I started to hum along with the music. Being on the ride brought back memories of when I was a kid. I would have been embarrassed to admit it at the time, but I've always liked it. It was one of my favorites at the park. I couldn't help but smile every time I heard those little animatronic children singing the ride's theme song in all of those different languages. It always made me feel like I was a small part of something bigger. This is the perfect way to end our trip, I thought. My son's eyes grew large as the boat entered the vast open space that encapsulated the ride. He dropped the grin from his face and replaced it with a look of awe. All of those animatronic children singing and dancing in the colorful clothing of the countries they represented filled him with a sense of wonder. I probably had a similar look on my face the first time I rode the ride. I continued to hum along with the music. It was hard not to. The song had a way of infecting you with its peppy message of unity. As we progressed through the ride, I would point out my favorite scenes to my son. He would respond by pointing to the ones he liked. The couple in the front of the boat didn't seem to be too impressed with the ride. They just sat there, looking around with bored expressions on their faces. If this was their first time on the ride, I could understand how it would feel old and cheesy to them, especially when compared to all the newer, high-tech rides in the park. I put my arm around my son, glad to see that he was enjoying the ride. Cool, huh? I asked him. He nodded in response without looking at me. His eyes were too busy trying to take in everything there was to see on both sides of the boat. It was sensory overload for him, but he seemed to welcome it. I looked over at my wife and smiled. She was looking down at our son, smiling at the enthusiastic way he pointed and gasped whenever he saw something unexpected. A second later, the smiles were erased from our faces when the ride came to an abrupt halt and the lights went out. 
plunging us into darkness. The sudden silence was unnerving. The only sound echoing through the enclosed space was the water lapping against the side of the boat. Nobody moved or said anything for several minutes as we waited for the ride to restart. Seriously? The young woman at the front of the boat called out. It figures. I could hear her audibly scoff after she said that. Of all the rides to get stuck on, we get stuck on the stupidest one in the park. I thought you said the country bear jamboree was the stupidest, her boyfriend said, responding to her outburst. That's not a ride, she snapped back at him. My son scooted as close to me as he could. I put my arm around him, reassuring him that everything would be okay. It's probably just some technical difficulties. These old rides break down from time to time. I hoped that was what had happened. A small part of me began to fear that they had shut the ride down for the night, forgetting they still had people inside of it. I squinted as the young man turned on the flashlight app on his phone and shined it in my face as he was looking around. Sorry, he apologized and quickly moved the light to the side. One last ride. The girl folded her arms across her chest, glaring at her boyfriend in the dim light of his phone. It's not my fault it stopped, he replied. Without warning, the boat suddenly lurched forward, throwing us back against our seats as we made our way along the track. Looks like it's starting again, I said, expecting the lights to come on and the music to start playing again. But the ride didn't resume. We were moving through the darkness, the dim illumination from the boy's phone casting long shadows over the motionless little animatronics as we passed swiftly by them. What's happening? My son whispered, keeping his eyes focused on his feet. He didn't want to look at the robotic children any longer. The darkness cast shadows over their faces, giving them a menacing appearance. They must have activated an emergency retrieval system to pull us back to the station. I guess they couldn't get the ride started, I answered. I think I got whiplash, the young man said, reaching his hand up and starting to rub his neck. You okay? I leaned down and whispered into my son's ear. I knew the situation was making him nervous, but he was doing his best not to overreact to it. He nodded. How about we stop on our way out and get some ice cream? My wife suggested. I think that sounds like a great idea. What do you think? I asked my son. Can I get hot fudge? That was his favorite topping. Of course you can, my wife answered and whipped cream if you want it. I glanced forward as the boat was rounding a curve, but instead of following the track like I expected it to, we suddenly veered in the opposite direction. Our new path was taking us straight into a wall. We're gonna crash! I heard the girl call out as she and her boyfriend raised their arms to protect themselves. I pulled my son close and braced myself as best as I could, but there was no impact. Right before the boat would have slammed into the wall, a concealed door opened up, which allowed us to continue on our way without slowing down. Where are we going? My wife asked. It looks like some sort of maintenance tunnel, I responded after looking at the undecorated concrete walls of the passageway. Why aren't there any emergency lights? She asked. There were emergency lights... I saw them evenly spaced down the length of the tunnel, but none of them were on. If it weren't for the boy's phone, we'd be entirely in the dark. I didn't mention this to my wife. I didn't want to scare her or my son any more than they already were. I want to go home, my son whispered. That was his way of letting me know he couldn't take it any longer. The darkness was finally closing in on him making him feel claustrophobic. We are going to go home, I tried to comfort him. Once we get off this ride and get you that ice cream, okay? Okay. A few seconds later, the boat was pulled through another set of doors and then came to an abrupt halt in the middle of a small room. The boy shined his light around, illuminating hundreds of plastic body parts that were hanging from the walls and ceiling. 
There were also a couple of workbenches lined with tools and several unidentifiable electronic components. We seem to have stopped in some sort of animatronic workshop. This is creepy, the girl said. Don't look, I said to my son. Even though the body parts weren't real, I was afraid that the scene might prove to be too much for him. What happened to them? He asked while looking at his shoes. It's just where they repair the robots from the ride, I explained, even though I wasn't sure that was the real purpose of the room. It looked more like an animatronic slaughterhouse if the condition of the body parts was any indication. Maybe we're supposed to get out? The boy stood up and looked back at me. I knew he was hoping I would agree with him, but I didn't say anything. There has to be another way out of here. The boy stepped out of the boat and onto the platform. His girlfriend, not wanting to be left alone, was close behind him. If they did happen to find an exit, I would gladly follow them, but until then, I was going to stay where I was. The pair searched along the wall, moving body parts out of the way as they searched for a door. They didn't seem to be having any luck. While my family and I were watching the couple, silently hoping they found an exit, there was a loud clatter from the opposite side of the room. Something had fallen and was rolling across the floor, getting closer to us. The sudden noise caused us to jump and turn towards the sound. What the hell was that? The boy asked, shining his light across the boat. My son buried his head in my side, not wanting to look. I could feel him trembling. My wife looked back at me when the object came to a stop a few feet away from her, illuminated by the boy's light. It was the head of one of the animatronic children. Oh my god, it blinked! The girl cried out. My wife and I were looking at each other when she cried out. Neither of us saw anything. I assumed that the girl was in a heightened state of fear and that her mind was just playing tricks on her. It was probably a shadow or a trick of the light playing across the eyes of the animatronic head. My wife and I looked over at the motionless head, then back over at the girl. I swear to God, it blinked! I didn't know if she was trying to convince herself or us. She seemed like she was on the verge of having a breakdown. That was something I didn't want my son to see, if I could help it. Why don't you try calling guest services? I suggested to the boy. Tell them we're stuck on the ride. I would have done it, but my wife and I left our phones back in our hotel room. That's a good idea. The boy turned his attention to the phone as he started to look for the guest service number. Got it, he said triumphantly, then pushed a button on his phone to connect the call. Before the call could go through, there was a whistling sound. Everything went dark as the phone flew out of the boy's hand. I could hear the screen shatter as it struck the floor several feet away. The girl screamed. My son started breathing quickly. I pulled him close and rested my chin on his head, using my embrace to comfort and protect him. As we sat there huddled together, I could hear the shuffle of feet as someone ran across the far side of the room towards the boat. The first person was quickly followed by a second, and then a third. They kept coming. Before long, there were too many to count. The room suddenly felt crowded. The boat rocked as the unseen group that came into the room used the open rows of seats to cross from one side of the room to the other. My son started to sob. Shh, I whispered into his hair. I didn't want to draw attention to ourselves. I didn't know what was going on, but I was sure that it was in our best interest to stay where we were and to be as quiet as possible. What the? The boy was unable to finish his thought as the mob reached him. The girl's hysterical screams were muffled and then silenced completely. All of this happened in the blink of an eye. It wasn't hard to imagine what had happened to the couple not when I could hear their bodies being dragged across the floor. I didn't know if they were alive or dead. I could only hope the same thing didn't happen to us. 
My wife, son, and I sat silently as the mob used the boat to move back to the other side of the room, pulling their heavy burden along with them. I winced every time I heard a thud, knowing it was the sound of one of the teenagers' heads striking the bottom of the boat. At one point, I felt like I was being watched. I knew that if I reached out with my hand, I would find someone standing on the seat right in front of me. I held my breath and didn't move until I felt the boat sway, signifying the person had walked away. I don't know how much time passed before the lights came on, but it felt like an eternity. The room didn't look as threatening when it was all lit up. I glanced around, looking for any sign of the couple. There was nothing to indicate they had ever been there. What the hell just happened? My wife hissed. I shook my head to let her know we weren't safe yet and used my eyes to point over at the sign hanging in front of the boat. I wasn't trying to get her to look at the sign. We had already seen it when we first arrived. It was a common sign seen hanging on the walls of most theme park attractions. It said, Please remain seated at all times. What I was trying to get my wife to notice was the small, animatronic child standing below and to the side of the sign. It wasn't there when the boat arrived. Given everything that happened, its smile seemed more of a threat than a friendly greeting. Oh, my wife said when she saw it. Are you ready to get that ice cream? I asked my son. I was trying to pretend this was all a normal part of the ride. He nodded his head and wiped his nose with the back of his hand. Please remain seated! I jumped when the announcer's voice was broadcast into the room. Your ride vehicle will begin moving momentarily. The boat suddenly started moving backward, throwing the three of us forward. I had to put my hand on the seat in front of me to steady myself. As we left the workshop, I kept my eyes on my son as the doors we exited through began to close in front of us. Why did you do that? I asked after seeing my son raise his hand and wave towards the workshop. The robot was waving at me. I tensed when he said that, but didn't give any other indication of how much that frightened me. Our boat returned to the ride's original path and continued on its way. The three of us just sat there, staring straight ahead, waiting to return to the unloading platform. The song blasting through the speakers didn't sound joyful to me any longer. It now held a sinister undertone I'd never recognized before. As the boat entered the exit tunnel filled with all of the numerous signs saying goodbye in various languages, I allowed myself to relax. I hadn't realized how long I'd been clenching my fists until then, but my relief was short-lived. At the end of the tunnel was an animatronic child, the same child that was in the workshop. It was waving its hand from side to side and holding a sign that read, The world is small, underneath which was, See you real soon. My son was pleased when the familiar robot came into view and returned the wave. I was not happy to see it. I had sat through that ride too many times to count, and there was never an animatronic in the exit tunnel, just the signs. I couldn't help but think of its presence there and the sign it was holding as a threat. A threat to keep our mouths shut. You've been listening to Small World by K.G. Lewis. K.G. Lewis is an American horror author residing in Atlanta, Georgia. You can find his work on Amazon as well as at Velux Books, www.veloxbooks.com. And now, to close out our broadcast this evening, I present... I found a decapitated head in my father's basement. It escaped.
by J. H. Salem. I looked at my father, wondering whether I should bring up the bloodstains. Well, the bloodstains and the decapitated head in the backyard. He didn't know that I knew, or at least I believed that. He sat sanding a board, the smell of epoxy and wood dust hanging thick in the air. His back was to me as he worked in the garage. The wooden piece in front of him seemed to take all his attention. How did one go about this, I wondered. Did we do an intervention? Dad, I'm sorry, but I think you might be a murderer. Or was I just supposed to call the police? But I couldn't turn my own father in, especially without talking to him first. Perhaps there was a reasonable explanation for the bloodstains and the head in the freezer. I had to give him the benefit of the doubt. I noticed his head raise a fraction of an inch, and in the reflection on the window in front of him, I saw his narrowed eyes staring straight at me. The night outside was dark and moonless, which gave the glass panes a pure black background. I swallowed, hard, a lump forming in my throat. Are you going to just stand there, or are you going to come in? My father said in his usual gruff, slow tone. I took a few hesitant steps into the garage. Hi, Dad, I said flatly, mentally berating myself for such a weak start to this monumental conversation. I had sat up at night, thinking of how I would talk to him and what points I needed to bring up. But when his cold green eyes turned to look at me, I felt like a fly trapped in a spider web. My mouth went dry and my tongue clung to the top of my mouth. Can we talk? He turned back to his woodworking. I hope you're not going to tell me you're gay or something, he said gruffly, a note of humor in his voice. I laughed nervously. No, <laughs> no. Uh, but I was wondering, whose head is that in the meat freezer in the downstairs basement? The meat freezer in the downstairs basement, he repeated, frowning. Yeah, you know, uh, where you keep the venison, I said. He sighed loudly, then gave a very long, hmm, afterward. I was surprised at how long he kept the sound going without breathing in. After about ten or fifteen straight seconds of that, he suddenly went quiet and turned his whole body to face me. So you've been poking around in my things, he said icily. I mean, not on purpose, but... That head has been in the freezer for over twenty years, he said, cutting me off. My father first put that head in there, and we've had peace ever since. You didn't take it out, did you? I froze, not knowing what to say. He turned to me, his eyes blazing. Did you? We walked to the basement together. I wondered if this was some sort of sick joke. I got to the bottom of the stairs first. When I saw the head was gone, I stopped in my tracks. So where is it, David? Where's the goddamn head? My father asked angrily. It was right here, I said, pointing to the small blood stain on top of the large freezer. My father swore. It's escaped, he said, his face a mask of fury. Damn it, you let it out! I knew this day would come. It's my fault. I should have told you long ago about the head. Now it's too goddamn late. So whose head is it? I asked nervously. It belonged to a very sick man named Edmund Chase, a notorious psychopath who stalked the area back when I was a kid. And so, my father began his unbelievable story of how the townspeople stopped Edmund Chase and why my family always keeps a severed head in our house. 
I remember when the first child went missing. I was in first grade, and the teacher and principal stood up in front of our class and announced that a little girl named Amanda Wenchler had disappeared. Anyone with information was urged to come forward and tell their parents or teachers. In reality, she had apparently been snatched from her house in the middle of the night, and it was unlikely anyone had seen the perpetrator. Nobody would ever come forward with any useful information about her disappearance. Later that week, her blood-stained skirt was discovered at the end of a sewer, but her body was nowhere to be found. Her parents would ultimately be forced to do a memorial service with an empty coffin. Three days later, a little boy in my class named Jake Gabini also disappeared. Someone had grabbed him as he played in the backyard. The town was in an uproar by this point. The townspeople would have lynched anyone suspicious in the area if dozens of state police hadn't come in to contain the chaos. My parents wouldn't let me play outside except for school and church. They refused to let me play in the yard or in the woods. Teams of neighborhood watch volunteers formed overnight, and armed vigilantes patrolled the streets after dark. But eventually, as always, the panic died down. By the time a month had rolled around and no new abductions or murders had taken place, people began to return to their regular routines. I started walking to school again, and that was when I met Edmund Chase for the first time. The white van pulled up alongside me, covered in dirt and grime, the back bumper skewed at an angle and ready to fall off. Hey there, little boy, the man in the driver's seat hissed as he rolled down the passenger side window. You're Frank, right? The first thing I noticed about this stranger was his eyes. They seemed to suck in all the light around him. They looked nearly black. He appeared massive, at least six foot six. His head nearly scraped the van's ceiling, and he took up the entire driver's seat with a commanding presence. Red, wavy hair ran down over his forehead and across one cheek. A diagonal slashing scar marred his skin. I quickly checked up and down the street. The nearest house looked about a thousand feet away. Thick woods with fallen trees and ivy covered both sides of the street. Yeah, my name is Frank, I said suspiciously. I had no idea who this man was. He laughed, sounding as jolly as any mall Santa. Oh, I know it's a little weird, but I just live over the hill, he said, jerking his thumb down the road the way he'd come. I know your dad... You look just like him. I swear, you're the spitting image. Thanks, I said. Anyways, I'm on my way to school, so I'll... Hold on one second, please, Edmund said, putting his arm out of the window to stop me while also giving me his most charming smile. I noticed how white all his teeth looked. They appeared as straight and small as the kernels on a cob of corn. Frank, my dog ran away earlier, and she likes to come around this area. If you could spend a couple minutes to help me find her, there'd be a fiver in it for you. My eyes widened at the prospect of five whole dollars, which you must remember was worth a lot more back in my day. He even offered to pay in advance. I walked forward to grab the bill he waved out of the driver's side window, fully intending to just take the money and run. But he grabbed my wrist with an iron grip and leaned close to my ear. I could feel the bones of my arm rubbing together as he tightened his large, calloused fingers further. I yelped in pain and tried to pull away. He started whispering. There are many mysteries in the universe. Headless bodies, missing arms and legs tossed into garbage bags, and steel tables covered in blood in secret rooms we'll never see. Hey, let go! I said loudly, trying to wrest my arm out of his iron grip. He just continued to whisper in a hissing tone, his eyes narrowing to slits as a lunatic expression came over his face. 
Yes, indeed. Many mysteries to uncover, like Christmas gifts to unwrap. The human body, too, is like that. Have you ever zipped off someone's skin like an unwanted second-hand coat? I need to go to school, I cried as he pulled something out from his lap with his other hand. He yanked me by the shirt and forced a piece of white cloth over my mouth. I gagged at the sickly sweet hospital smell that emanated from it. You must be a very stupid boy, he whispered in my ear as I inhaled the cold, astringent chemicals. If you think you're going to school today... I awoke with a pounding head and a dry mouth. I felt my hands bound behind my back. A gag lay tightly pressed against my mouth. Well, oh well, boy, someone said enthusiastically from up front. I turned my head, realizing I was stuck in the back of the van next to countless tools and coolers. I heard the crack of a can opening and saw the man chugging a beer as he drove. Today is going to be a fun day, he said. It's so beautiful outside. I mean, look at the sun and the clouds. Not too hot and not too cold, eh? He looked in the rearview mirror, meeting my eyes. There are some things they don't teach you in school. You have to get out and experience the world to learn them. I felt the van turning abruptly. Then we were going over rocks and potholes for about 10 or 15 minutes. I figured we must have turned onto some unpaved forest road. I'd offer you a beer, the man said. But you're not old enough. The law's the law, you know. With a gleeful smile, he pulled the van over to the side of the road. I slid forward as it lurched to a stop, smashing my head on a toolbox. I kicked against the bindings around my feet and legs, trying to loosen them, without success. I reckon this is as good a place as any. All right, let's get started. He opened the driver's side door before going to the back of the van and opening the two rear ones. He pulled me up with his strong killer's hands as I whined and protested through my gag. Laughing, he threw me to the side of the dirt road. I landed hard, the wind getting knocked out of my lungs. The man started pulling out coolers of beer and lawn chairs. He dragged this all out to a dirt clearing 50 feet or so from the road. Then he started bringing over tools, axes, saws, box cutters, pliers, and sledgehammers. Finally, he came and grabbed me, throwing me over his shoulder. The fall breeze blew by, smelling like leaves and evergreens. I realized with a sense of dread and horror that these would likely be the last normal sensations I'd ever experience, the last place I'd ever see. After this moment, it would feel like an eternity of ripping and screaming, and then, in the end, merciful darkness. He threw me down at the center of the dirt clearing in the woods. He opened a toolbox, took a box cutter, and flicked out the blade. It gleamed, catching the sun's rays. He brought it down towards my face, his smile widening as his hands began to shake with excitement. I'm sorry to say, he said, smirking, but my past subjects have said that this is quite unpleasant. Where should we start? With the eyes? He moved the blade a fraction of an inch from my right eye. I flinched, trying to pull back, but he punched me in the face. Don't move! Did I tell you that you could move? He cut off the gag with the box cutter. I noticed how sharp it was, how it slid through the cloth like butter. Actually, I think I'll cut out your tongue and eat it. Open up. He moved the blade towards my lips, gripping my jaw with his hand and prying it open. I started screaming as his fingers closed around my tongue. 
A gunshot shattered the silence. The man looked down at his chest, seeing the blossoming circle of blood that now dripped down his white shirt. He grabbed at his heart, choking. Fuck you, he said as he fell forward, landing hard on top of me. I felt the warm blood dripping down on top of me. Struggling, kicking my bound legs, I tried to get out from under the dead body. A moment later, I saw my father and uncle running from the direction of the dirt road, a rifle slung over each of their shoulders. Holy shit, Frankie, my father said, pulling the madman off of me. You're okay. Thank God. Good thing I told you to watch him when he walked to school, huh? My uncle said, smiling. We got the bastard. That's Edmund, all right, my father said, flipping the body over with a grunt. The man's eyes stared blankly up at the sky, his pupils large and dark. A small trickle of blood ran from his mouth. All right, you get the shovel and start digging, my uncle said, and I'll get Frankie the hell out of here. Frankie, you never saw anything, okay? Let's get you home. So, that was the end of it. They took me home and buried his body deep in the woods. Vigilante justice prevailed and stopped a grave evil, as vigilante justice always does. They decided not to get the police involved since my uncle had a criminal record and wasn't supposed to be in possession of a firearm. We were just happy that the abductions and killings would end. And, for a few months, they did. But by the time Christmas came that year, things had worsened. I remember rushing downstairs on Christmas morning and seeing the flashing of police cars through the windows. The red and blue from the emergency vehicles mixed with the red and green hues from the Christmas tree lights, shining off every decoration in a rainbow of colors. My mother stood at the front window, a steaming cup of coffee in her hands as she worriedly stared outside. What's going on? I asked her, coming up behind her and hugging her. The neighbors, she said, looking across the street. The Hadricks. Apparently, they were all found dead in their house. Murdered. The crime scene people have gone in and out all morning. I saw them taking the body bags out on stretchers. I felt cold all over. Where was my father? Did he know? I wondered whether I was being foolish. It couldn't have been that same man, that Edmund Chase. I saw him die. Of course, there could always just be two psychopaths operating in the same area. Why not? It happened in California with Ed Kemper and Herbert Mullen, after all. But as I saw the authorities taking out one black body bag after another, a cold chill ran through my body. I found my father and uncle in the garage, their faces pale and expressionless. I had heard whispering when I entered, but when they saw me, they stopped talking. Frankie, my father said in a falsely cheerful voice. Merry Christmas. You should be celebrating. It's almost time to open presents. Did that guy Edmund kill our neighbors? I asked. My father and my uncle shared worried glances. That's ridiculous, my uncle said. Why would you ever think such a thing? You saw him get shot in front of you. We buried his body deep, six feet down at least. He's dead, Frank. He's as dead as Disco. I don't get it, I said, frowning. We haven't had a murder in our town in forever, right? Then, suddenly, one guy goes crazy and starts killing random people, and you guys stop him. So, it just can't happen like that, my father said, shaking his head. Dead is dead. You'll see. The cops will catch whoever did that horrible shit to the Hadrix before you know it. There's no goddamned way it's connected to Edmund Chase. Despite my father's assurances, 
Rumors began to spread like wildfire, for there was a connecting factor in all the murders and disappearances, including the Hadricks. In every case where the police recovered bodies, they found the bodies drained of all their blood and with their hearts cut out. All victims showed signs of extreme torture, and in all cases, household tools such as pliers, hammers, and saws were identified as murder weapons. Police surrounded Edmund Chase's house after a couple of days. From what my father later told me, they had gotten a break in the case after finding carpenter screws and microscopic pieces of wood shavings at the crime scenes. They had begun to look at anyone in the area who was a known carpenter or involved in woodworking, and eventually had identified the screws as the exact same type used in his carpentry shop. But of course, they found the house empty. A massive search began, and every car going in and out of town was stopped at checkpoints. Over time, the Fuhrer began to die down, and after a couple of weeks, I had nearly forgotten about Edmund Chase. I tried not to think about what had happened, or the gruesome death I would have suffered if my father and uncle hadn't come. The night that he came back, I had gone to sleep early. Ever since the abduction, I had a recurring nightmare where a faceless silhouette of a man drove nails into my eyes while he whispered in my ear, Hey, little boy, how you doing now? I woke with a start, feeling a cold hand pressed over my mouth. In the dark, I could only see the tall shadow of someone standing over me. If you try to scream, I'll cut out your eyes. The familiar voice of Edmund Chase said. It sounded different, gravelly and deep, as if he'd been inhaling dirt for the last few weeks. I felt a blade forced against my neck, pressing hard against the jugular. A drop of blood rolled down my skin, warm and sticky in the cool night air. I smelled rotting flesh and soil, an earthly odor and a foul, choking one mixed together. I whimpered, trembling and terrified. Get up and come with me. If you try anything, I'll take you out of here piece by piece. The master doesn't care if the blood is warm or cold, after all. I rose slowly, putting my hands up in the air. I thought about calling for help, but I knew it would be suicide. He could stab me twenty times over before my father or uncle got in here from their rooms with a gun. He moved me towards the center of the room, standing behind me and keeping the blade pressed hard against my throat. Once we had reached the center point, he took a vial filled with black fluid from his pocket. He flipped off the top and flung the droplets in the air. I watched in amazement as they hung there, frozen in place glistening like greasy oil. Then he began speaking in some demonic, gurgling language I'd never heard before. The frozen droplets in the air immediately got sucked towards a center spot, like a black hole eating comets. I watched in amazement as a pinpoint of blinding light erupted in the center of the room. It looked far too bright for a moment, and I averted my gaze, seeing spots dancing behind my closed eyelids. But after a few seconds, I looked over and saw it had dulled and expanded considerably. Slowly, almost lazily, it morphed, sections of it popping out in the air as the center hovered, defying gravity. Through the pieces, I could see another world where a pale sun shone, a place filled with steep cliffs and silver streams that wound through the canyons. The dark purple color of the sky reminded me of blood clots and fatal injuries. As the pieces expanded, I quickly realized the portal was growing into the shape of an archway. This is where the Master roams. Edmund said as he pushed me closer to the portal. This is his world. My door flew open at that moment, and my father and uncle stood there, peering in. Frankie? My dad called. Are you okay? 
Uncle Roger said he heard footsteps and talking. At that moment, they saw me, the knife pressed against my throat, my feet only inches from the portal. No! My uncle cried, taking my dad's arm and running forward. My father stumbled and then caught his feet, rushing to catch up. I passed through the skin of the portal. It felt like walking into a warm, buzzing lake, the silky texture of reality splitting as I came out on the other side. Before I knew it, I was being dragged past a massive 30-foot-tall rock and down a steep trail. I looked back and saw the portal closing, its archway shape collapsing back into its central point in large, irregularly shaped patches. Two men lay at the foot of the portal, slowly rising to their feet. Everything seemed surreal, as if I would just wake up at any moment. The last thing I knew, I'd been lying in my bed, so it made sense. But the small pebbles that got stuck in my sandals and bit into my skin told me I was awake. This was the first time I had seen Edmund Chase in the light. As I regarded him from the corner of my eye, the bile rose in my throat. Blood and dirt stained his clothes. His skin looked very pale, like marble. His eyes gave off a slight silvery glow, and the iris itself had turned the color of white gold. His lips looked very red, and every one of his teeth had grown long, sharp, and pointed. The places where my father and uncle had shot him had regrown. Black tissue with a rough surface like coral shone through his ruined clothes. Come on, he whispered. He gripped me tighter, the rotting smell coming off his body in waves. I tried to look back to see if my dad and uncle were following, but the massive boulder blocked any view. We traveled across this dead world for twenty or thirty minutes, the sun above barely giving off any heat. I didn't see a single animal, insect, or plant the entire time, and I wondered if this entire place was devoid of life. It seemed like only rocks and walking corpses could survive here. When we got close to the master, I felt it. When I first glimpsed the tent, we had just begun traveling over a flat plain of cracked granite and limestone. It stood out against the dark, rocky world, bright and colorful above the muted browns of the landscape. It looked almost like a medieval circus tent, its entire surface colored bright red with interspersed black and silver lines, all meeting at the top point of the structure. As we got close, I could smell a sweet, cloying incense carried on the wind. A moment later, we arrived. Edmund Chase pulled aside the flap and motioned for me to go inside. The entire tent looked filled to the brim. I heard chattering in many foreign languages. Looking around, I saw people of all races and builds sitting or standing in the bleachers. The smell of rotting bodies in that tent rapidly became overwhelming. I looked around and saw all of the people had sharp, vampiric teeth and skin that looked as smooth and hard as a statue's. All of them had silver eyes that seemed to shine with an inner luminosity. In the center of the stadium, I saw an ancient man. His withered arms and legs looked like sticks and he had no hair on his body. His eyes had turned into wide silver orbs, and he gnashed his sharp teeth together over and over, licking his dry lips. He had on some coarse brown cloth that covered his chest and waist. We bring another sacrifice to you, master, Edmund Chase said to the withered old man going to him and kneeling beside the elaborately carved bed. Is it time to begin? The master waved his hand as if he were shooing away a bug, which Edmund took as a call to begin. He stood up in the center of the crowd, raising his arms. Everyone went silent. 
We will begin with a prayer to the master, he said. The audience bowed their heads and chanted in unison. We throw the dust to the wind in celebration of old skin. We move heaven and earth in celebration of his birth. Under the eye of a hungry god, skeletal and thin, hooded and cloaked, filled with hunger and mirth, we act only in his eternal name. The master who feeds the flock. We eat the hearts to feast on light. We eat the eyes to gain his sight. The crowd rose, hundreds of silvery eyes turning towards me. Edmund Chase grabbed me by the arm and brought me over to the master. We have brought food for you, ancient one, he said. The master didn't seem to care one way or another. He didn't even look at me. I just want to die, he whispered in a soft, raspy voice. You all feed me, and then you feed on me. I'm... I'm just a cow, and my blood is my milk. Edmund ignored this, instead taking a large dagger out of his pocket. It had a handle of polished obsidian, and on the blade it had strange symbols and runes embossed in silver. You must eat, master, Edmund Chase said, putting the blade to my wrist. With a quick slash, he drew the knife across my skin. I yelped, trying to jump back, but his iron grip wouldn't allow it. Pulling my arm forwards... He put my spurting wrist to the lips of the old man. Rising with difficulty, the master licked his lips with a snake-like tongue that had been split down the middle. Then he began to suck at the wound. With a sense of revulsion, I felt his light touch as he drank, pulling my wrist closer with each satisfying gulp. I pleaded for him to let me go, to let me live. As he continued to suck at my blood, I felt like gagging, my stomach doing flips as I saw rivulets of blood streaming down my arm. After what felt like an eternity, he let me go. I turned to see Edmund Chase grinning, looking at me. Got to get his strength up, he said. I think your jugular vein would give a lot more sustenance for the master. The meat has the strength, the master said, but the blood has the consciousness. We'll give you his heart, Edmund Chase promised. Then you'll feel strong again. Then we can drink from you, master. The master scowled. I felt he was a prisoner here just as much as I was. Edmund Chase put the knife to my throat and walked me over to the master. He made me bend over so that my neck would be above his mouth. I began to pray, knowing I was about to die. A gunshot rang out. I didn't dare move with the knife pressed so close to my jugular. I had my eyes tightly shut. Drop the knife! I heard my father's voice shout, and another gunshot rang out. I heard the sacrificial dagger fall with a clatter, the pressure on my neck disappearing in an instant. Boy, the master whispered to me as chaos erupted all around us. I looked behind me, seeing Edmund Chase on the ground with a bullet wound in his head. The area was quickly healing with black tissue creeping over and covering the spurting hole. Your only chance to survive is to drink my blood and gain the power spread through it. Hundreds of abominations surround you. If you listen to me, you will survive. What are you asking? I said. He looked at me with his hypnotizing eyes. Drink my blood a small bit, and you will gain the ability to leave this place with a few words that I'll teach you. 
you'll also gain some ability to heal. In exchange, I want you to cut off my head. I want to die. I've wanted to die for the past 500 years. I've been around since the time of Emperor Justinian, and I'm very, very tired. These abominations just bleed me for my powers. They drink from me over and over so they can live forever. What's the command? I asked quickly. The words to get out of here. He told me, and I memorized them, whispering them repeatedly. I took the sacrificial dagger, kneeling before Edmund Chase as he twitched on the ground, and quickly sliced through his neck with the sharp blade. I rose and went to the master. Thank you, he moaned as I cut his throat. I knelt close to his papery, ancient skin and sucked some of the blood from the spurting wound. Like rotten eggs, it tasted sulfuric with a strange, sweet aftertaste that made me want to gag. By the time I had finished cutting his head off, his head and body had started to dissipate. I saw the skin sucking in towards the bone, then dissolving into dust. Soon, his head had turned into a dried-out skull in my hands. I put it down on the ancient bed next to his other bones. Then I turned, grabbing Edmund Chase's head, deciding it was time to get the hell out of this nightmarish place. My father and uncle both had pistols, and they were rapidly shooting. The gunfire exploded over and over in the tent as they made their way towards me during all of this. None of the audience members realized I had killed their sacred cow. They all focused on my father and uncle, hissing, jumping out of the bleachers and running at them. My uncle swore as one tackled him from behind, biting at his back and shoulders. He raked my uncle's back with claw-like nails, shredding his clothes. My father put another magazine in the pistol and shot the creature in the head. It fell to the side, its eyes rolling back in its head as it gnashed its teeth and kicked its feet, before going limp. My uncle tried to rise, but a dozen more creatures filled the gap, biting and clawing. I ran towards my father with Edmund Chase's head cradled in my arm. Two of the creatures tried to grab my father, but he ducked, pistol-whipping another across the head before sprinting towards me. We have to get Roger! My father cried as he ran, but I shook my head. I knew we couldn't save my uncle. If we tried, we would all very likely die in the process. Without another word, I grabbed my father's hand and uttered the commands. I felt hands dragging us back, and I pulled against them with all my strength. The portal blossomed in front of us, and as my uncle screamed and fought with the abominations, I pushed my father through and followed him back to our house. What should be done with a demon's head? My father asked a local occultist the next day. I had been watching the head closely, and it sometimes opened its eyes or moved its mouth. I didn't like it. I wanted to make sure Edmund Chase didn't return and start killing people in our town all over again. You either put it in salt and bury it, or you freeze it forever, she said. Either one should keep it safe, but if it gets out, the remnants of life left within it may allow it to escape and begin its evil all over again. It's different if the being wants to die, of course but I don't get the sense that the head you possess has renounced its life energy. I'll make sure it doesn't get out, I said. And if it does, I'll deal with it. You've just heard, I found a decapitated head in my father's basement. It escaped by J. H. Salem. J. H. Salem is a horror writer who has written many short stories and series for channels on YouTube, 
Reddit, and TikTok. And on that note, listeners, we conclude tonight's episode. I hope that this new year presents you with the opportunity to achieve all that you are aiming for. Assuming, of course, that those goals all further the proliferation of the dark, the macabre, and the horror that we all know and love. Thanks to J.H. Salem, K.G. Lewis, and Velix Books for providing tonight's tales. And thanks to all of you for ringing in the new year with me. Until next episode, my friends. Stay spooky. You've been listening to the Horror Hill Podcast, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Tonight's episode was hosted and narrated by yours truly, Eric Peabody. Original music provided by Eric Peabody and Nikki McSorley. Finalization by Eric Peabody and Craig Groshek. Got a terrifying tale of your own that you'd like performed? Email it to us at natalie at chillingtalesfordarknights.com to have your work considered for future production. Seeing as how we're all living in a technological nightmare of our own devising, I'll ask you to follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on social media and upvote, subscribe, and hit the bell notification icon if you're listening to this on YouTube. Not only will you have appeased the dark gods of cyberspace, but you'll be kept in the loop as we prepare more terrifying content. If you'd like access to uninterrupted horror, free of ads and these annoying bookend segments, might I recommend becoming a patron? You'll get access to hundreds of episodes of this show, as well as everything from the other programs in the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights cabal. That means all of Otis Jiry's scary stories told in the dark, Drew Blood's Dark Tales, Paul J. McSorley's Fear from the Heartland, and more. It's a veritable smorgasbord of horrific delights. As for me personally, I'm on most social media as Viking Guitar or Viking Guitar Productions. I'm always on the lookout for new stories to narrate and new music projects to mix or master. If that's of interest to you, feel free to reach out and we can talk turkey. Also, I will be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. If darkness is what you are after, listener, your search is over. Yet, let it be known, you haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you.